Hi everyone, uh, today we are going to continue our discussion about the quicksort and that's the hardest and uh, the most mathematical part probably not just for the quicksort but for the entire course okay well this today well I, I'm not enjoying teaching today's content but as a uh, master level algorithm course you can see that and then let's move on and talk about midterm one and uh, remember the midterm one will be this week on Thursday okay well for this midterm this will be a closed internet exam and you are supposed to uh, work on all the questions by yourself and uh, during during this test there are some of the allowed reference you you, you, you can do uh, like you can use your own notes and you can use the my lecture notes or the lecture uh, uh, or uh, the lecture videos and uh, you may say hey you just say close internet and so how can I watch the videos okay so if you are watching my my lecture videos on YouTube that's fine that's the only possible use of the of the internet when you are working on this midterm okay and then your own homework solution so those are the references you are able you are allowed to use during the test okay and then other than that you cannot send emails you can you cannot uh, have other people answer your question you cannot un uh, help each other or sit together and uh, discuss anything or use check uh, checks or course hero or this kind of uh, online pl platforms and if you uh, if I see any violation and we are gonna have a really really serious talk and this this kind of cases may go really really ugly so uh, please everyone don't try anything funny you are gonna give yourself big trouble okay well let me provide a uh, a study guide on what are the concepts you are supposed to know well the, uh, the very first thing well uh, remember at the very beginning of this course we spent time to review the basic uh, uh, Python programming and plus the basic data structure and they they are not tested but I, I, I'm not creating questions to test those things. However, there will be questions, say I ask you to write pseudocode or I ask you to write uh, real Python code, or I may, uh, uh, I, may re I may expect you to know uh, how does the array work in Python. And if you don't know that, then you're gonna have trouble. And the next topic is induction. And remember, there are three major steps for the induction what's the basis where do you start from and then number two what is your inductive hypothesis and number three uh, starting from the uh, inductive hypothesis and how do we prove that if n is true and then the n plus one is also true okay so induction that's an important topic and I have back by the way I have a, a one extra video talking about uh, another example of induction make sure you have watched that one okay and the next next topic is a symptom uh, notation and we are talking about uh, the big cyta and before the big cyta we have the big O and big Omega and then how do we prove uh, the uh, the asympto uh, asymptotic notations of a given algorithm and remember we are counting how many primitive steps we are going to execute before we can have the result if the input size is n okay so uh, the total cost of running this algorithm using n as the input size will be the tn and then based on a polynomial version of the TN and then we can prove the big O big Omega and then putting them together we have the big Cyta and the next topic uh, some common asymptotic uh, performances and for example what is the fastest and what is the lowest possible that should be constant a constant algorithm means well no matter what is the size of the input and then the running time is always constant and then there's no change and what's the next best one the next best one should be O log n O log n is the next best and then what's the next the next is probably the linear which is O n and if we move on we have n log n 
and if we go higher, we have n square, etc. Okay, so uh, when I gave you a bunch of the asymptotic performances, and I I ask you to sort them from high to low or low to high, and then you should have that in your mind. Okay, well, and there are some of the algorithms we have already discussed in this class, either uh, either in homework or uh, a uh, as a uh, algorithm analysis or other algorithm we have discussed about and for example for the sorting we have insertion sort we have bubble sort and we have the merge sort and then we also talk about the search algorithms we have the sequential search and I uh, probably you, you, you still remember the that's the analogy I gave you. So if I walk into a classroom and then I'm looking for Bob, and then I can ask student A, are you Bob? And then I ask student B, are you Bob? So I just visit all the students one by one, and then that is a sequential search. And for the uh, for the binary search, uh, well, I'm going to close, uh, close my eyes, walk into the middle of the classroom, and then I'm going to say, Bob, which side are you in? So if I hear Bob, replies me on my right side and then I know for the left side of the class Bob is not there and then I go to the right side and in the middle again I close my eyes and say hey Bob which side are you in and then I listen where does Bob reply so I always try to cut my search space by one half and that is the binary search okay and then for those uh, for those algorithms we have already discussed and then uh, what are their asymptotic performances and for some of the algorithms then you want to uh, distinguish their best case their worst case and for some of them uh, the best and best and the worst case they are not the same and for example if we talk about quicksort and then what's the uh, what's the best case of the quicksort what's the worst case of the uh, of quicksort and then uh, for be best case and worst case of the quicksort what are the time complexity right and then eventually how do we uh, prove them Okay, and the next topic is recursion. And recursion is a, uh, a important part because based on recursion and then we have the master theorem. And if we don't, if we, if we don't have recursion and then our life of analyzing algorithms will be much, much easier. But unfortunately, a recursion is a very important family of algorithms. Okay, so how do you design uh, the recur uh, recursion algorithms and there are two mindsets and number one we have the divide, divide and conquer right and for example merge sort and number two we if uh, another uh, well the second strategy i call that getting one step closer and uh, for those type of algorithms you should be able to analyze and you should be able to uh, write the uh, write the pseudocode too okay and when you uh, when you have the a recursive algorithm and then you should be able to come up with the recursive version of the TN by reading and analyzing the, uh, the code. And after we have the recursive version of the TN, the next topic will be how do we solve the recursion, recursive TN. And our goal is we start from a recursive version of the TN and we want to have the TN as a polynomial as a polynomial of n and after we have the polynomial version of the tn and then we can figure out the upper bound we can figure out the lower bound and eventually we have the big side that is our goal so well to uh, to solve the recursion uh, we have three different solutions. We have the substitution. Well, uh, this is my favorite one. Remember, you want to divide your work uh, w a working zone into half. On the right side, we figure out the substitutions, and then we plug in the substitutions to the left side. And well, this is my favorite one because that's the easy one to do, the best one for the beginners. But you have to do a lot of writing. Uh, that's the part I don't like too much. And uh, we have the iteration one. And uh, if you are uh, if the recursion is not so hard and then you get handy handy with uh, solving recursions the iteration one is a little bit easier and you write not so much compared with the substitution and eventually we have the master theorem and the cool thing about the master theorem is we start from a recursive definition of the TN and then we analyze uh, the, what is a what is B and what is Fn and then using those information we figure out which case it is and then we can jump after we figure out what case case of the master theorem and then we can jump directly to the big side so for the uh, uh, so, so for the master theorem you can save a lot 
of the writing. So master theorem is cool. But remember, master theorem cannot solve all the recursions. For some of them, and eventually, if you find that you are able, not able to solve that with master theorem, and then you have to go back, you, ha you have to do either substitution or iteration. OK, and then the heap. Uh, well, uh, for the heap, this is a, a data structure. And based on this data structure, and eventually we introduce a sorting algorithm called heap sort. So well, starting from the definition of the heap, and you, should, you, need, to, you need to know to know what is the heap, and then uh, how it can be represented uh, using the tree structure and using a 1D array as well. And what are the heap properties? And then there are three different functions we talk about. Number one, what is heapify? For the heapify, we want to fix only one node and we want to put this node down. And then we, we want if uh, the new new location is still not the right one. We may have to pull it down again. So, uh, what does the heapify do? And we, it fixed one node. And what's the time complexity? The time complexity should be O log n. Okay. And how about build heap? And for the build heap, what do we do? What do we start? And then what do we finish? And then in this process, what is the time complexity? And then how about heap sort? And for the heap sort, and what do we start? And then what's the process? And can you work a heap a heap sort out using uh, using a uh, on a piece of paper uh, given a random a list of the random numbers? Okay. And then using the heap, and we have a priority queue. And priority queue can be considered as a a data structure implemented by the heap. And remember, in this class, we talk about an example, assuming that we are a very, very poor institution and there's only uh, one printer shared by a lot of people. And then all the people may send in the printing task to, to that printer at the same time. So there, uh, this printer has to maintain a priority queue. And for that priority queue and the highest, uh, uh, the, the printing task with the highest priority will get processed first. Okay, well, if you forgot about that, and then you can go back and I do remember I have, I have done a, one example using, uh, using that priority queue. Okay, and the, the next part, which is the topic we are going to finish today, the quick sort. So for the quick sort, and uh, well, remember in our oh oh, this book is so heavy. In this book, we do have a uh, uh, a, uh, uh, a one implementation, but I decided that's not the word I want to go. So I provided you a more widely used version of the quicksort. So in this in this exam, feel free to use that version as well. And then, well, uh, for the quicksort, uh, the very important part is actually the partition. So what what the, does the partition do? We separate the list of the value into two parts. So pivot in the middle, and then the the values. Uh, equal or smaller than uh, smaller than the pivot, or the va uh, the values greater or equal to the pivot. So we separate into two parts, and that's the partition, right? And then for the partition, what's the time complexity, and what are some of the better strategies in picking the pivot values? And remember, when we pick the pivot using uh, the algorithm I give you, and then I always pick the first value as a pivot. And there are some smarter ways to pick the pivot values as well. And then after you understand the partition algorithm, and then we move on and we can analyze the quick sort. So what does the quick sort do? And what's the worst case? What's the average average case? What's the best case? And how do we prove the complexities of the worst case and the best case? Okay, so those are topics you are uh, you are expected to see in the exam. So as a professor, I don't want to surprise my students. Uh, in my exam. So I want to be uh, crystal clear on what you are expect to know. And uh, well, well, and the next thing, well, I'm going to show you a few of the sample questions. I'm going to show you, uh, I'm going to talk about why I designed this question and then how this question can be answered. Okay, so let's see the first one. Well, the first, uh, assume that we have a quick sort algorithm provided in day nine lecture. And then uh, instead of using the first value as a pivot, now I want to plug in a new new algorithm to select a pivot. And for the new algorithm to select the pivot, and it is a login. 
Okay, so instead of simply grabbing the first value as a pivot now, we have a small algorithm to select a pivot. And for that pivot, and uh, well, there is a slightly higher cost because if you just grab the first value to be the pivot, and then what's the cost? The cost is one that's constant but for this selecting pivot algorithm there's this slightly higher cost we should log in okay and my requirement is you want to uh, i want you to analyze the new version of the quicksort and assuming that it does uh 90 percent to 10 percent split constantly okay so that's not the best case but it's not super bad either so we always have 90 percent on one side and then 10 percent on the other side and then i want to uh, i i ask you to prove the big O and you have to explain the reasoning okay so why am I asking this question uh, this this is an algorithm test your understanding of the quicksort and plus it tests you your understanding about the asymptotic uh, performances that is a quick question I created today actually okay so how do we answer that so uh, the number one question is, you got to know what function does this algorithm change? Well, I'm talking about this, the login pivot selection or uh, selection part. So what function? does this change and the answer should be partition you can know that and uh, uh, if you if you visit the partition algorithm I believe it should be in the first three lines you grab the first value as a pivot now that line has to be changed you want to call another algorithm to grab the pivot right so that's a partition and the next question is what's the new cost of the partition function so well to answer this question you have to know what is the time time complexity of the old version of the partition what is that that's a big o right and now if we want to add a log in to that so we have a big o in and then in this process we also add a log in what does this mean in versus log in which one grows faster or which one is more significant that's the O n, right? So in the O n algorithm, when we add another log n, what does that mean? This means it doesn't change the time complexity at all because anyhow, it is it is already a O n algorithm. This means even though we have changed the partition algorithm, but the cost of the partition is still O n. Okay, the next part. Uh, after we know this information, how do we, how do, how does that change the cost of the quicksort? And then remember, we have this kind of t, uh, this kind of tn because we always have ninety percent on one side and ten percent on the other side. And then, and remember, I have drawn uh, this kind of the tree structure that we are splitting. And then we have the ten percent on one side and the ninety percent on one side. And then for the, this ten percent, we will split that into one percent uh, and nine percent. And for the 90%, it will be split to 9% versus um, 81%. Well, remember, I have drawn this on my scratching, uh, on my whiteboard, uh, virtual whiteboard, I should say. So eventually, you will know that uh, even uh, for this part, it is still a O-N. So this is this tree structure and the height will be log and the base number will be uh, 10 divided by 9N. So this will still be a O and uh, o, o n log uh, o n log n in this case with the base number of the log as 10 divided by 9 so the short answer is it doesn't really change anything because this log n the cost of picking a better pivot it will be absorbed by the o n algorithm of doing the partition Okay, so this is a, a cool question. It tests really a lot of things. It tests if you understand the, the partition, if you understand uh, the quicksort, and then if uh, uh, how do you compare the O n versus the O log n, and then, well, uh, uh, the analysis of the 90% versus 10% of the quicksort. So even this is just a small question and probably I'm going to put 10 points to this question. It covers a lot of the aspects, nothing super hard, but putting everything together and this question can be a tricky question in the exam. 
Okay, well, uh, in the exam, uh, probably this question is a little bit harder. So I decide to uh, show this question to you instead of give this question, uh, give this question to you guys in the midterm. Okay, the second one. Uh, well, solve the recursion, recursion below with the master theorem. Assuming that the base case is when n is 1, the cost will be 1. Okay, well, and for, for this kind of question, I can give you any wild, crazy tn's. I'm just giving you a few as examples. So tn equals 3 tn divided by n divided by 9 and n plus n. And if I want to reverse the, the 9 and the 3, and then I have a, a different Tn. And then if you want to analyze them, and those two are, are quite different. OK, well, let me just show you how to, how to do one of them. OK, I'm picking the first one. So Tn equals 3 Tn divided, n divided by 9, uh, and then plus n. Well, uh, and remember for this question, I'm requiring you to use the master theorem. So uh, you don't have to really uh, remember the master theorem because uh, this uh, you, you you have that on uh, on your textbook or the course uh, the course uh, course notes. So you don't have to remember them, but you do have to understand how to solve the how to solve the recursions using the master theorem. And to solve the master theorem, there are the first step is you want to ask what what are the a, uh, a what uh, b and the fn well in this case it's quite simple a is 3 b is 9 and then fn is n okay so this is the first step and what's the next step which one is faster fn or n powers log b a well that is a very important question to answer when you're doing the master theorem so what is F, uh, fn fn is n right so fn is a linear algorithm and then n powers log b a. What is that? Okay, log b a. b is nine, and then a is three. So b a log nine three. What is that? Well, if you don't know that, and but you should know log three eight should be two, right? So log log nine three should be uh, n zero point five, because uh, if you have the nine, and then you do a square root, and then you get three, right? So this is a uh, log b n power log log b a will be n powers 0 0.5 or the square root of n okay and uh comparing uh the n versus n power 0 0.5 which one is higher and you should know okay n uh, n is higher well and to to be very accurate following the uh, the case one two three of the master theorem what we can say is if you have the log ba and then we add a small positive value of the epsilon and we can pick the epsilon as a 0 .0 0 0.1 for example and then we have n uh, n power 0 0.5 and plus 0 0.1 which is 0 uh, n power 0 0.6 well but remember this fn is n so uh, fn is still a uh, a faster one and then uh, n power 0 0.6 is the lower bound of fn okay so this is case 3 so for case 3 that is actually a a trickier case because once you say it is it is case three you also have to do one one more step of the proof that is you have uh, using the given a and given given b and the given fn you have to prove that there exists a constant c so that a f n divided by b is smaller than c multiplied by fn so let's let's plug in the a b at fn so what are we proving so a is 3 and then n f fn is n itself and divided by b so divided by 9 and that is n multiplied by 1 divided by 3 or one third right so if we want to put it at the, like this, so smaller than a constant multiplied by fn, and what what can this constant be? The so one third is smaller than one half. So n multiplied by one third is smaller than n multiplied by one half. What does this mean? This means a multiplied by f n divided by b is smaller than c multiplied by fn. It holds when c is a one half. So after we have proven this part we can finally say this case can uh, this is a scenario that we can apply the case three so 
Well, what is K3? K3 is the theta Fn, so that is a theta n. So, well, this is the cool thing about uh, about the master theorem because you start from the uh, recursive version of the Tn, and then after you figure out what case can apply, and then you jump directly to the big theta. Okay, so for this question, when I design that, and I well, I see a lot of the possibilities, and I can just plug in different values of the a and the b, and then different function of the fn, and I can give you a a wild a wild collection of the tns, and I can ask you to solve them. And among them in the case three is the hardest. And I have already, sh I have already show you an example of the case three. And if it is not case three, and then you don't have to worry about this part. Okay, so that's a uh, that's a simple question two, and let's move on to simple question three. Well, that's the induction. That's a part I I love. Uh, I love. Uh, but for some of you guys, you really struggle a lot. So in this simple question, I'm going to show you another question about the induction. And uh, by the way, I also uh, I also created this question by myself today. Okay, so well, uh, the question is use the induction to prove that when n is greater or equal to four, and then n log two n oh, is greater than n plus log two n. Okay, and for the induction, and remember, there are always three steps or three major steps. And the number one is the base case. For the base case, well, I have already told you, uh, n is greater or <coughs> excuse me, bless myself. Okay, so uh, I have already told you that you want to start from the four. So at least we want to prove that for uh, the start point, which is n equals four, uh, this uh, this statement. It's true. So when n is four, and then n log two n will be a uh, four log two four, you will get eight. And then n plus log two n, will, you will get a six. So eight is greater than six. That is true. Okay. So that's the base case. We have already plugged in the number and proved that uh, the base case is a true. And then for the inductive hypothesis, you don't have to prove anything in the second step. You simply want to say that very clearly. That is the inductive hypothesis. We assume that for an given n value greater than uh, greater or equal to 4, the statement n log 2n is greater than n plus log 2n holds. OK, we just assume it holds. And then the step 3, which is a harder one, uh, well, which is the hardest one. We want to prove that for the n plus 1, it also holds. And this means for this for this equation, and then we want to substitute all the n's with n plus 1's. In it still holds, okay? Okay, so well, on this page, I'm showing you my thinking process, okay? This is not what I'm gonna write down on my exam paper, but this is the thinking process of how do I prove this part. Our goal is we want to prove that, and then uh, my thinking process is to prove this, and then how we can make this proof a little bit easier for me. So since we want to prove this part, and then I want to multiply the uh, log 2 n plus 1 into both this n and then this plus 1. So I'm breaking this part, the left part into two parts. So we have n log 2 n plus 1 and plus log 2 n plus 1. And for the right part, I'm not changing anything at all. And then you will notice that for this part, for the left part, we have log 2 n plus 1. And for the right part, we have log 2 n plus 1. So those two parts can cancel each other. So we only have to prove that n log 2 n plus 1 is greater than n plus 1. So we are getting a little bit easier, hopefully. Okay, and then I want to move this n to the left side. So this will be n log 2 n plus 1 minus n is greater than 1. And then I want to extract this n from the left side. So n multiplied by and then log 2 n minus uh, n plus 1 and then minus 1 outside of the log is greater than 1. Okay, so for this part I did uh, uh, and after this part I did a small trick. I dropped the n 
Why? Because I know n is greater than 1. And if I can prove that for whatever is in the square bracket, it is also greater than 1. And guess what? We have two parts. n is greater than 1. And whatever in the square bracket is also greater than 1. If we multiply those two together, we are guaranteed to have a value greater than 1. So I just drop the n, and then my goal will be I want to prove that whatever in the square bracket is greater than 1. And then, well, there's no need for the square bracket anymore. And then I want to move this negative 1 to the right side. So I want to prove that log 2 n plus 1 is greater than 2. So if the log 2 n plus 1 is greater than 2, this means the value of the n plus 1 is going to be greater than 4. And this means if you want to drop 1 on both sides, and then if we, we have to prove that n is greater than 3. Guess what? n is indeed greater than 3. Why? Because we, uh, the, we, we are starting at n is 4, right? So for all the n values we want to touch in this question, they will be greater than 3, guaranteed. Okay, so we are trying, uh, well, in this scratching part, what I have done is to prove this part, I want to prove this part, and to prove this part, I want to move down and prove the next part. And eventually, I want to reduce this problem size into something really, really small and basic, that is n greater than 2. But remember, for this, this is my scratching process. This belongs to my scratch paper. It doesn't belong to my, exa uh, my exam paper because I'm doing reverse engineering. So how do I do the formal proof? For the formal proof, remember we are starting from the known, the most obvious part, which is n is greater than 3. And for the formal proof, where do we end? We end here using this line. This is exactly what we want to prove. Okay, so let me show you how I did that. n is greater than 3. Okay, obvious. We know that. And then n plus 1 greater than 4. Of course, we are adding 1. And then log n plus 1 is greater than 2 because n plus, n plus 1 is a value greater than 4. So, makes sense. Okay, and then if you want to minus 1, and then uh, whatever in the square bracket will be greater than 1, well, that's fine. And then if we multiply by n on the left side, of, that's also okay, because whatever in the square bracket is greater than 1, and then we multiply, multiply another n that's greater than 1, so that's still good. And then we multi, uh, for this n, we want to move that inside of the square bracket, so we have the n log 2 n plus 1, and then minus n is greater than 1, okay? And then for this minus 1, I want to move that to the right side. So I have n log 2 n plus 1 is greater than n plus 1. And after that, I want to add a log 2 n plus 1 on both sides. So we have, uh, we have the log 2 n plus 1 here. We have the log 2 n plus 1 here. And have we finished? No. One more step. For the left part, we want to extract the log 2 n plus 1 so that we have n plus n plus 1 log 2 n plus 1 is greater than n plus 1 and then plus log 2 n plus 1. And then that's the end. Why? Because this is exactly what we want to prove. Because we, we know that for n, it holds. And now we are able to prove that for n plus 1 it also holds, okay? So this is my formal proof of this induction question, okay? And this is not an easy one. And for the exam paper, I'm going to give you a slightly easier version of the of the induction. And if you're new to the induction and this is not a this is not a easy question for you, but even though you, you are not able to do uh, the full formal proof and remember how do you set up the induction. Number one, you want to prove that the base case or the basis is true. Number two, you want to put very clearly, uh, put down very clearly what is your inductive hypothesis. And number three, you want to do a proof that if n holds and then the n plus 1 also holds. And for the formal proof part, and usually I will do a reverse engineering on my scratch paper and then after I have done that and then I just flip 
everything and then I will have a induction like this and this is a formal proof okay so those are three uh, questions I I want to show you and hopefully uh, this video can help you prepare for the midterm okay good luck